Without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Tori Smith, the founder and CEO of Endiotics. Tori, do you want to say hi? Hey, folks. Uh, thank you so much for that intro, uh, Brian, uh, Allison, everyone. A uh, real honor to be here. And my goal with this presentation is basically just to offer some inspiration to prospective founders uh, because we walked into Founder Institute with a napkin sketch and we emerged with a funded company that was incorporated. And to date, we've actually taken over $400,000 from funds that have gone through the VC lab in the Founder Institute program. So it's a, it's a beautiful network and we're very excited to be, uh, well, talking about little tiny robots that can be used to help people. Okay, so let me, uh, let me throw some slides up here. All right, so uh, basically, what do we wanna do here, right? Break boundaries, innovate, right? What I'm really excited about is that, you know, if, if you've ever been in a hospital, right? Veteran, civilian, anything, right? Everyone experiences gatekeeping in different kinds of ways, right? Um, and, and that's not really endemic to any one type of system, right? It's just once you have more than one person, things get complicated. And the beautiful thing here is that we have opportunities to use technology to do lots of that arduous sort of administrative work on the back end so that you can let doctors treat patients and let patients feel like, you know, they're getting that care that they really need, right? So there are tremendous uh, opportunities available all the way from like digital health to hardcore, you know, robots in the body, right? So let's, uh, let's move this along. So the way I see it, why don't we start with our veterans, right? Let's give them the best care in the world and then use what we learn there to take it to the rest of the US patient population and then the world at large, right? So I'm gonna go over a little bit of my experience sort of in the health tech founding world, just so you can sort of get an idea of what you might be up, up for if, uh, if you take this adventure. Um, I'll speak about endiotics specifically because it's kind of what I know about. And I hope that there are kernels of wisdom or experience in there that might actually apply to you know, your dream, your vision. And then finally, let's hear about all these main, amazing companies that, that are up here today. Okay, so first of all, you know, what, what the heck is health tech, right? You know, I, there are so many words out there. And the funny thing is, there are investors out in the world who, you know, would say they're a health tech uh, investor, but they're really looking for sort of a very narrow part of the silo, right? So all I really want to say here is that health tech is anything that helps people, you know, lead better lives using technology, anything from hardcore med device to mental health, right, to wellness. And the key is, if you can communicate what your vision is um, and show that your team can actually make it real, there's probably an investor out there for you, no matter what stage you are in your development. Okay, so uh, first of all, let's just talk about regulatory, right? Because health is regulated because we don't want to hurt people. We want to heal people. And there's always a crazy fine line between advancing the standard of care and maybe taking too much risk to learn how to do it, right? So we're gonna, it's, it's kind of critical that we learn about things like HIPAA compliance, patient privacy. But the funny thing is on the other side of that is we wanna give patients access to their own data quickly, like maybe on an app on their phone so that they're feeling in control so that they have a sense of agency and dignity, right? Um, if you're interested in making devices, you know there are many different levels of regulation from almost no regulation, like Band-Aids are pretty easy to make, right? Uh, when you start sliding catheters into the body or you know putting putting robot pills into the body things start to get a little bit more serious and that's when you start to look for devices or technologies that have come before you that you can use as a predicate right and finally you know the highest tier would be like pacemakers artificial hearts these things can take many years to get to market like 10 years and th these are things that like major institutions typically are helping to develop um, so the, to back off here a little bit, there's a big spectrum out there in regulatory. And what you're going to have to do as a founder is try to construct some sort of a reasonable narrative um, that you can take to all the stakeholders from investors to doctors to potential patients, right? So for example, with, with endiotics, we say, hey, this is a little robot pill, but it looks a lot like a normal pill camera, but it squirts water out the back. That means we can probably get it through on a predicate pathway a little bit faster. And uh, 
and get to market pretty quick with your investment. You know, that's a reasonable narrative to offer an, an, an investor. Okay, so fundraising in health tech is, is interesting, right? Because there's an imperative and that can help your case, but then there's also fear of regulation and long paths to market, right? So the key is just like there's a regulatory spectrum, there's a huge fundraising spectrum. Wherever you are, whatever your vision is, we can help you get it funded, all right? Talk to me, let's, let's work together on that. I put government grants right at the front because when I ran this, you know, when I started this company with my friends, we put it right at the back and now we're kind of paying the price for that. Get your grant application started early, learn the process. The process is not trivial, but, but it is intended to help you, right? And there are companies out there that can help you do it. Um, from there, individual angel investors are sort of like the, the, the magic that makes this, this universe go around in, in, the, in the, the fun, I'd say like the founding space, right? These are people who will invest on you because they invest in you because they like you and your team and your vision, and that's about it. Um, the reason minimum check size sometimes hover around 15K plus or minus is that there are legal fees associated with the name on your cap table. Um, and so it doesn't really make sense to take tiny checks sometimes. Um, those checks can get up into the $200,000 range. Um, and uh, finally, you can go to angel, angel groups. Um, that's a bunch of angel investors that work together. They're sort of notoriously long in their decision-making process, but there are some great people out there, some great groups. My advice would be make sure they syndicate their check into one check and not like a bunch of tiny checks that are individual names on your cap table. Ask me how I know. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes they even charge you money to present. So it's it, they're kind of their own place, but they are a very interesting link between small checks and early stage venture capital. So from there, we move into the VCs. You know, I think every founder has a dream of, you know, a giant VC writing the one big check and then you, you've just succeeded. Um, getting venture capitals to invest in you is, a, is an interesting adventure, but it's important to note that within that spectrum, there are seed stage funds, there are people willing, willing to write money, you know, on day one. So just understand there's a spectrum out there. And as we move down this list, you know, you're getting increasing levels of due diligence required, right? You're going to need a data room with a lot of stuff to back up your case. And finally, one of the newest developments is equity crowdfunding. Um, basically, you can now do sort of the if equivalent of a Kickstarter for your for your med device startup or your, your medical startup. Um, they, they typically syndicate the check, which is good. It's sort of considered dumb money, which is both good and bad. The good thing about it is people aren't joining your board and telling you what to do, right? So. Uh, maybe one of the challenges could be that some VCs respect it, some get turned off by it. So bottom line, understand there's a whole spectrum for fundraising and that's okay. All right, let's uh, keep going. So let's talk a little bit about endiotics, right? Our dream is to create a whole new standard of care where tiny robots go inside the human body and fix things, right? Like this is straight out of science fiction. And our goal is to kind of start somewhere reasonable. Um, a little bit about our personal story creating endiotics. Um, you know, I'd worked in the med device scene for many years um, in many different areas. I'd always kind of felt stifled and I felt like the scene was uh, a little bit too risk averse. In other words, I was kind of like an arrogant cube jockey, right? Um, you know, I could barely see past my own cube at that time. Um, but eventually I, I, I got to this point where I was feeling a little depressed and feeling like maybe my career was sort of peaking in a way that wasn't too exciting. And then I saw an ad on Facebook that said, practice pitch your idea for free at the Founder Institute. And you know, at that point, I just didn't really feel like I had anything to lose. So I clicked on the ad. I went down to their janky little office on El Camino. I got slaughtered. Um, I mean, it was embarrassing how bad I did, but I could tell they were actually trying to see some merit in my notebook sketch, which is all we had for the company. And uh, they suggested that we apply. And four months after starting that program, um, you know, it, uh, we, you know, like we said earlier, we emerged with a funded incorporated company. Uh, two and a half years after that, um, we've actually put 23 of these little tiny robots through our own bodies. And, uh, you know, we recently did our first cadaver study at Mayo Clinic, which we'll talk a little bit more. And we're actually getting ready to define the MVP and, you know, start, start getting this thing through trials and to market. So, pretty exciting story for us. And we're resources to founders that, you know, are probably scared and, you know, nervous about how to do this. Like, 
hopefully we can serve as, a, as an example that this is really something that you can do if you care about. Okay, so if I want to do like nanosurgeons, what are we actually going to do to start the adventure, right? Let's let's start this in a real but but humble way where we can define a real product, right? That we could actually make and take to market. So we looked at the stomach, we looked at the GI tract, and we realized it is really arduous and sucky if you have a belly ache and someone needs to jam a tube into your, you know, down your throat and into your stomach to look around. We started interviewing patients and doctors and found out it takes most patients like three or four visits to the hospital before we knock you out, jam a tube down your throat while you're totally unconscious and uh, look around, right? And we were interested in the world of passive pill cameras because it seems like that offered maybe an alternative to that. And we were kind of blown away to realize that pill cameras are used like 1% of the time. They're, they're a niche use product. And so we started asking ourselves, hey, what if we could make a pill move in real time with a live video feed, maybe even use it you know, to sprout surgical tools eventually, right? And that's when we started to get really excited. So uh, this is PillBot, right? You can think of PillBot as just a moving eyeball in the stomach. You grab an Xbox controller, you got a live video feed. If you're a patient, we want you to be in your living room. We want you to never go to the hospital most of the time. Just skip breakfast and drink some water. Uh, that's worked four times, uh, 14 times for me. And we're going to look around, you know, maybe there's a little bleed, maybe there's an ulcer, maybe there's something scary, or equally as important, maybe we find nothing, and that gives your gastroenterologist a powerful signal of where to go next. Pillbot currently costs us about 35 bucks to make, right? So we're, we're really hoping to create a cheap mass market screening tool that is sort of like hard telemedicine. If you've got serious GI stress or pain, swallow one of these in your living room and hopefully that resolves your problem. And then the cool thing is if it doesn't, well, now we've just vetted you aggressively and now you can go get an advanced gnarly procedure without waiting all the extra months, right? So let's cut out the gatekeeping as well. Anyways, this thing is like a drone. It's like a quadcopter with four little pump jets. Okay, so this is Dr. Kumbari. Uh, we call him Viv. And this, you're looking at the number one gastroenterologist in the world. Um, he heads Mayo Clinic's gastroenterology program. Uh, Mayo is widely considered to be number one in the world. He formerly came from Johns Hopkins, which is number two. And basically he said, Tori, if you can give us a moving eyeball in the stomach that, that actually works, right? And that's where I'm going to show you some really janky imagery later to show you what our adventure to trying to get it to work looks like. He says, this is a total game changer, right? Because it's unlocking this whole new world. I mean, look at the VR goggles on the bottom, right? You know, like I want to, I want to control these robots by connecting the propulsion system, you know, to the orientation of my Oculus headset. Um, and I want to paint real-time holograms inside the patient that you can see with AR goggles. I mean, this is going to get fun, right? Okay, so I think we know plenty about me. You got to build yourself a team that people will believe in and invest in. So uh, Dr. Lubke out of the Google X Moonshot Factory um, is our, our CTO, a co-founder. This guy is amazing. Um, James is probably my best friend. We collect machine tools in a warehouse. And that gives you a team that can make devices, do electronics, do the crazy circuit design, right? And as you start to build a team that people can believe in, you can start to take checks, which is cool. And then we're also excited to have the number three institution in the world, um, King's College London, which uh, you know Dr. Hay is heading up. And uh, basically at this point, I think we've got the right team to take this out to market. And uh, you know now all we have to do is make the damn thing work. So, <laughs> so how do you do that, right? You know, let's say you've got a day job. Let's say you're a little depressed. Let's say you're not 22 and, you know, you know, the, the most brilliant data scientist in the world or something. What if, what if you're a normal person? How do you start a company, right? And the key is you can actually start wherever you are, right? There's an investor out there willing to talk to you. And so we literally just started building robots, right? You know, and slowly got them smaller and smaller. When they got to thumb size, people started to get very... You know, it, you know, interested, and finally we got down to pill size, and 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 things really got off to the races. So, 
just start wherever you are and institutions like you know i mean vha with the innovation uh, network and then also with founder institute or any good accelerator will help you take those next steps don't wait on your ideas right okay and then then just show that you can make progress over time right so you incorporate you raise some money you file some ip uh, we recently got our first patent granted we're excited about that we also have a lot of other patents in the works right um here you can see viv and and our cto you know at that mayo cadaver study um basically just show over time that you can make this thing real right and uh look these are not the the best images in the world but we shot those inside my own stomach live on a video call right and you know we're starting to see real things you know we're slowly inching up our resolution we've got a lot of work we can do with the optical stack you know let's put a fisheye lens on there let's put filters so you get less haze and more clarity um we're fundraising aggressively because we need software engineers to help us with code and firmware right but every step of the way in a monthly update we're communicating to our stakeholders on a bcc where we just say hey here's the good the bad and the ugly of this last month and here's what we're going to try to do next month um, and people people believe in a story like that okay you have to be able to describe what you're doing in the context of what's around and what you're really trying to create. So for us, it's very simple. I wanna give a physician a tool that's as powerful as an endoscope in a patient experience of swallowing a pill, maybe even in their own, own home, right? That's pretty awesome. Maybe we can do it without a room full of capital equipment. That's what allows you to unlock this telemedicine to remove that gatekeeping, that keyhole of you know this room full of million dollar equipment let's put it in your living room. Let's make it dirt cheap. This is what technology can do. Um, and yeah, that's the thing. Like you check enough of these boxes and you can create something that most patients can use that will save them tons of money and let the doctors just be doctors instead of patient herders most of the time. You know, let's, let's give some credit to some other cool stuff out there. People are doing tiny jellyfish with magnetic actuation. Uh, Peter Diamandis, who, you know, we're big fans just funded uh, this place called Bionaut Labs. They're using external magnetic actuation to make tiny little, little you know, sort of semi-robotic entities move around in the body. Um, I think our differentiation is just hardcore, no capital equipment, right? That, that was important for us. Like this plus an Xbox controller and maybe a phone or tablet, that's our system, which is kind of cool. All right, so you gotta somehow find a way to make money or have a market, right? So for us, we sort of play hopscotch between endoscopes, which are big market and exciting and global, and pill cameras, which is kind of a niche market, but it provides regulatory footing and context for us to begin the adventure. And it really helps us with the narrative with investors. So you know what? We'll go after the stomach endoscopy devices market. We'll try to expand into the whole GI tract. That's seven billion. We think we're creating this new category of micro robotics inside the human body. Um, and you know the overall endoscopy market, sixty-seven billion, right? So there are opportunities here if we can just make one real product, show people this is possible, bring other people in to follow along and join us, and you know, let's make tiny robots. So you know what? You got to have a business model. That's important. It's been one of the hardest things for me as a sort of a creative type to wrap my head around. But if we can build this for thirty-five bucks now. And if a pill camera sells for 20, uh, 500 bucks, right, in the US market, and we'll probably get this thing under like 25 bucks in volume, right? It's pretty simple. Um, if we can do all those things and we can eliminate four visits to the hospital and sedation and the risks of perforation and abrasion, right? And, you know, just basic risks with, with sedation itself, we can save patients huge amounts of money, right? Like, my stated goal on LinkedIn publicly is I want to cut the cost by an order of magnitude. I want to drastically increase access to procedures like this. This is how we do good in the world. And you know what? 95% gross margin, single use disposable. It's also a great way to make money for us. So what an exciting world we live in, right? So the next question is how the heck do you get a hardware enabled FDA regulated device to market right you know that's that's kind of scary and how do you get anyone to invest in you right the key is just go step by step right so you know we started swallowing these ourselves that was a good way to get investment uh, it also got us attention in the medical community 
now we've done cadaver study and I think we know what our MVP needs to look like. So we're designing that and fundraising for it. We're gonna take that into IRB trials. And the goal is first revenue by the end of 2022. And you, you can call it Elon Musk time and you, you might not be wrong, but hey, that's, that's our goal, okay? And that's, that's actually a pretty, pretty, pretty exciting track to be on. But it doesn't really stop at the moving eyeball in the stomach. That's just a product that makes this real, makes our company real and gives us a future. We see the future very interesting. You know, let's sprout surgical tools. Let's go everywhere. Let's go rice grain size. Let's do brain surgery with this. But you can't do any of that if you don't have something real. And people have been swallowing pill cameras for 20 years. It almost seems like there's pent up demand for the next step, right? Do we have to wait 20 more years for the next thing or maybe just one? Okay, so um, you know we're gonna wrap this up pretty soon. Uh, we've swallowed these in uh, airplane cockpits falling out of the sky. Um, you know, we're, we're working on buoyancy issues, um, but if we can give you an endoscopy falling out of the sky, we can probably give you an endoscopy in a refugee camp. Um, we could probably do that in low earth orbit. Uh, if you wanted to, it could be, even be in the hospital, but we think your living room might be more fun. Um, you know, what, uh, let me see, let's, uh, let's try to move to the next slide here. Um, let me let me show you 20 seconds of this video. This is actual onboard footage from an MIT demo we did like six months ago. This is like the worst video in the world, but this is live from a robot that's going down my esophagus. It's about to pop into my stomach. And now we're going to start slowly driving it around. And you can see some features, right? Uh, it's like, it's not perfect, but it is in fact real. And that's that's kind of the fun thing here is you can be vulnerable now these days. We're in a post Theranos world. What that means is you can just say what you have and go find investors who will believe in you, right? Um, and uh, you know we're not here to knock on anyone because things change over time. I'm not sure in the 1990s or early 2000s, I could have shown you this video, which is literally just me playing remote control in a fish tank, people might think, you know, this isn't serious, this isn't medical. I think today this is serious and this is cool. And it's a little goofy, intentionally so. You'll notice here that there's a little floaty pack on it because we're, we're still trying to cut some weight. So we're sort of, you know, giving a little kids floaty. We think a custom battery will help us with that. Um, but yeah, we're, we're getting closer to that moving eyeball on the stomach. And for the, for the last video here, Let's just show you a quick uh, clip from uh, the cadaver study. So what you're gonna see here is a carefully curated clip that doesn't include any patient anatomy or inappropriate stuff. But we're very proud to show you this. What you're looking at is a moving eyeball in the human stomach, right? We want to make the optical you know, performance better, but what we're showing you is we can create a robotic platform that can do medicine at a distance, right? And, and hard medicine, right? What happens when we start putting tools on it, right? Things start to get exciting. Um, it flips around here. You can see those little thrusters on the back. Folks, it's really just a pill that squirts water, right? Uh, you know, I, I think we can get that through FDA and I think we can show that this can be awesome for patients, right? So let's, uh, let's move this along because if, if there's any kind of something to take you know, if there's anything to take from here for the for the founders listening, it's that if we can walk in with a napkin sketch to a, to a, to an accelerator, um, and we can walk out with a company and actually get to the clinic, right? And this thing is hardware, you know, enabled. If it, it, it's FDA regulated, if we can do that, then I'll bet that you can take your idea and make it real too. And my commitment to you as a founder is that my network is open to anyone who's building something cool that's gonna help people live better lives, right? So let's do it. Let's get to these pitches. Thank you, everyone.